Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of the, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. Of Ivan Melendez. And there was the double... Horns down by the Texas A&M Aggies on Elimination Sunday. Uh, the first one, first day of elimination in the College World Series up in Omaha. Texas season comes to an end. Two and Q, as most say. Two games and done. But it was the third trip in the past four years or four seasons for the Texas Longhorns. By the way, this episode 149 sponsored by our guy, Jim Saxon, State Farm Insurance Agency. Those guys are efficient. Uh, they've been around Austin forever, and they will serve all of your insurance needs across Austin and this great state as well. Now, the the big thing about the College World Series this uh, on Sunday was the rivalry, the rivalry, the Aggies Longhorns rivalry. They, I mean, it may not ever happen again in our lifetime. Um, the chances of that happening and the chances of the simple fact that OU was in the same is in the same bracket as Texas, Texas a and of course, Notre Dame, a mild rivalry just hasn't been uh, taking place uh, as far as baseball goes. But uh, Texas, Notre Dame had somewhat of a rivalry uh, in the 60s and 70s. But uh, yeah. Texas season ends 0-2, or the College World Series 0-2. They head home, and the numbers are really uh, alarming, if you will, for Texas in those two games. It just wasn't the same team that we've been used to seeing as far as run production. Now, the pitching part, um, we, we've – it reared its head. I mean, you're facing the best programs who are playing the best college baseball of the year right now, the eight best programs playing the best baseball of the season in Omaha. Um, the, the, the pitching, I, I honestly feel like the fatigue of the pitchers, as even the starters, because uh, Pete, Pete Hansen was your only one who has been very consistent throughout the season of course Lucas Gordon really hats off to David Pierce and the Texas coaching staff uh, for developing Lucas Gordon in a hurry and kind of fast forwarding his growth and that all happened because of the injury to Tanner Witt back in uh, I believe it was uh, in March and when he had to have Tommy John surgery And, and I know this sounds like a broken record but it really taxed the Texas pitching staff forced the maturation of a lot of guys now there was development um with southern um you saw some other guys of course tristan stevens if you want to call it a demotion it just happens to some pitchers throughout the season um throughout different years in which they experience uh lulls and they battle tristan stevens has a battler's you know he's a competitor a competitor, no doubt about it. But uh, he embraced that role in the bullpen, won that super regional clincher at East Carolina for the Longhorns. But uh, the rest of the pitching staff just inconsistent, and I believe, in my opinion, that took its toll. Let's hear from David Pierce and the Longhorns as you know they they try to make sense of what happened, the season over with, just like that after the ten to two loss to Texas A&M, and that was really, you know, really hard to watch because Texas really took charge of that game early on, but then A&M stormed back, and it's that big inning that Texas has really had trouble dealing with this entire season. And keep in mind that these sound bites you see raw motion just moments after that loss on Sunday, which ended the Texas Longhorn season, finishing the year 47 and 22. Overcoming big innings has been kind of the story of the last three months, and that popped us today. And 
It, I think it just has worn on the position players and feel like at that point, you know, just constantly playing uphill. So maybe it just caught up to us of, of that feeling. We spent a lot of time standing on the field today. We all had the same goal, and that was to, you know, have a dog pile at the end. It's, I don't think it's really truly hit me yet. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we fight for this, and this is everything that we work for, you know, and it's just one of those things that we didn't get it done today, and, you know, we'll be all right. We'll, get, we'll be right back there. I know Coach Pierce will do a great job next year and get us back. Um, we, had this, we had a good approach. We stayed with our approach we've had all year. It's, it's worked for us. Um, they made good pitches. At the end of the day, they, they were better than us today. Yeah, that uh, plain and simple. Texas A&M was the better team, the better team. Um, you know, Texas A&M, Jim Slosnagel, the first-year head coach, uh, and he did wonders at TCU. Took them to, I believe, five College World Series appearances. Were really a na national title type good a team. Um, it, it's just the Texas had a potent offensive lineup, but they were not potent in those two games up in Omaha. I mean, I'm just looking at the stats here. Uh, Texas produced um, six hits against Notre Dame and three runs in that 7 3 loss to Notre Dame, uh, losing 10 to 2 to Texas AM. So they scored five runs in two games. Um, just not a lot of good, not a a productive two games for Texas and then we're outscored 17 to five overall. Um, the, 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 I think what we're just analyzing Texas in that potent lineup, of course, uh, the Hispanic Titanic would really hit a slump. It, it was ineffective. He did have a key RBI really barreled a ball good enough to get the run in, um, against Notre Dame, but uh, he just didn't look himself course facing really good pitching um notre dame and texas a and m and it, it's the big inning the, the notre dame had a three-run fifth texas a and m had a four-run second and texas was just not able to recover um against against those after the responding to those big innings and it was really hard to watch because I, it didn't make sense you're just wondering but you could tell the the scouting of the opposing team, that being teams, Notre Dame and Texas A&M, really uh, the coaching, you could tell the preparation for the Texas lineup. This is one of the most potent Texas lineups in Texas baseball history from top to bottom. I mean, you, you, you have one of those types of situations in which it, it, you felt like I did personally, felt like Texas was going to have to outscore a lot of people this year um, and, and the Texas defensively uh, was very prideful, very prideful group. And, but in the college world series, I mean, they, they played well defensively, but like the two errors against Texas A&M um, and the wind, the wind coming in in that big park was about 20 miles an hour. I think it was both games, Notre Dame and Texas A&M 20 miles an hour. Um, both games, so uh, a power hitting team, they they had some problems trying to barrel that ball. Um, meanwhile, Notre Dame and A and M, they were putting the barrel on that Texas pitching. I mean, unfortunately, if you look for Pete Hansen, four and a third innings pitched in that first game, nine hits, six runs, and um, you know it, it's, it was hard to watch because it was you were just starting. I started to realize. Texas hit their ceiling. Texas hit their ceiling. This was an, a college World Series team, but barely. They showed a lot of fight, showed a lot of character in the regional and the super regional. I mean, they are obviously one of the top eight, eight to ten teams in the country. And I thought that this was one of the better, um, really did a great job of coaching. Did a phenomenal job of coaching, I thought, with this group, especially what they were up against. I, don't, I think a lot of people underestimate um, the injuries. Austin Todd had one temporarily. He, he's, I mean, he's been through so many injuries, and we'll get to him in a second. And, and then you had, obviously, Tanner Witt, which uh, 
just shook up the Texas pitching staff as a whole. You needed to develop a ton of guys and fulfill roles. I thought we saw development this season late to Duplantier. Um, Southern, he's got a ton of velocity. It's the location, which is an issue, um, locating his pitch. Um, but, yeah, I think this was the ceiling for this Texas team. I mean, 47-22, and 22, third trip to Omaha in the past four seasons, four full seasons. Um, that was it. And, and that, that is the situation that we faced that uh, I think Texas fans have got to realize. But it was really cool to see that end with the – Texas A&M rivalry. Texas didn't get to face OU for the, uh, I believe, sixth time this season. But, you know, when you look at all this moving forward, um, you look at the strength of the Southeastern Conference. And so technically if with the additions of Texas and Oklahoma on the horizon, that's six of the eight teams in the College World Series, which are technically SEC teams. And as we – Move forward looking at the strength of the SEC gain that will be gaining strength with the addition of both OU and Texas. Well, Coach Pierce of Texas and, of course, um, Jim Schlossnagel, you know, they, they talked about that and the future of the SEC with Oklahoma and Texas. We need to keep making the right decisions for – our student athletes to have this type of experience, not only here, but on campuses. We played earlier in the year in front of the second largest crowd ever at Dish Falk. I mean, no disrespect to Omaha, but it, it's a lot tougher to win there than, than here, you know, because there's more, more fans. We, we had more fans rooting for us and they didn't have as many rooting against us. But, um, and you play in the SEC, you know, they, you play in the SEC every weekend. You, this is, no, again, no disrespect to Omaha, but it's, it, this is, it, it's like that almost every weekend, almost everywhere you go. So. And that's obviously something I'm experiencing for the first year. Um, well, all, the SEC, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to. I mean, it can only, it's only going to get better. Yeah, 100. percent It's going to be fun. And as you saw, Coach Slosnagel referenced playing that midweek game, Texas A&M in Texas, second biggest crowd at the Dish Falk. Field history that, that's uh that, that speaks volumes right there so it's going to be fun um as far as Slosnago and the Aggies what it meant beating Texas of course they're not I mean obviously they're living you saw the beginning of this uh episode the horns down I mean everybody does it people I think the message to Texas fans move on past being offended by the horns down just think of it as a compliment that uh you know they're thinking of you they're thinking of the Texas Longhorns constantly. It's a compliment. They they seem to think of the opposing teams. Everybody does it. It's old hat. Nothing needs to be made of it. And even the Big 12 needs to move on past it. Horns down happens everywhere. Now, as far as uh, excuse me, Texas A&M and their reaction to beating Texas, hey, it's what you think, but they answered with class. And But beating – for Texas, beating A&M – would have been huge, but it's the same for the Aggies as they move on. They're going to have to face uh, Notre Dame next because Oklahoma won again. Oklahoma's sitting pretty at 2-0 and in bracket one, and here's what the Aggies had to say posts that went over Texas at the College World Series. I don't want to downplay it, but I think those things are more for the fans uh, than they are for for um, the players and coaches. If we, if we get into that that kind of thought process, then we're going to be – you know, having a different mindset in one game than we are in another game. I mean, I would have rather beaten Oklahoma, to be honest with you, and be 1-0 and playing a night game. It's, it's a little cooler at night. At the end of the day, it's really just playing the game and playing a, a nameless opponent. But there is a little extra um, umph behind everything, especially when it's Texas, because um, if you just look at the fan bases, there's, there's a lot of, like, genuine hate um, between each other. So <laughs> we kind of feed off of it. It's a lot of fun. We respect them. They're a great ball club. But, yeah, there, it, there's a little more, um, I don't know, competition. Yeah, I just I don't know what to say. But, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, fun rivalry. Good times. Was not a good time for the Texas Longhorns and the Texas fans. I think 
Mark Pena and that uh, Occupy left field group tweeted out that they were in a bar a couple hours for the game, and there were tons of Longhorn fans, tons of A&M fans, um, not a lot of trash talking because it was an elimination game. And two old storied rivalries who have met hundreds of times, um, you know, there was just mutual respect, but not a lot of trash talking. That does not surprise me. Hey, I want to give a tribute to a guy, Austin Todd, Round Rock, Texas native, um, received a COVID year, extra eligible, extra year of eligibility due to COVID, like so many players, student athletes have. Um, the kid was perhaps the heart and soul of this group because he's fought through so many injuries, uh, two of which I, that I recall uh, that uh, really forced him out of play. Um, him to miss a lot of ball games as a Longhorn, but the guy, um, I remember him in high school. He, he was just a prototypical outfielder who has some pop in his at bat can hit for power, can scatter all over the field, oppo, pull, hitter, everything. Just a great, just a good baseball player. And, man, I, it has been a joy to watch him just from a just a baseball purist fan's point of view. His parents, too, they're part of Occupy Left Field. Um, just a good baseball family. And it's a uh, – uh, hats off to Austin Todd, man. He's done a lot for that program, but just as a baseball player and as from a fan's point of view, loved watching him play just as appreciating good baseball talent. And that has been so much fun to watch as he wraps up his career and not where the Longhorns wanted to be. But, uh, yeah, it has been so much fun. And Austin Todd, if you're watching this, your family, man, you guys – it's been a joy to watch you and uh, look forward to seeing how you uh, continue with your baseball career. And, yeah, it's been a joy watching you in high school and on the 40 acres at the University of Texas. Yeah, Manscaping the Man Cave. These guys are a sponsor of us, manscaped.com. Um, of course, they continue to evolve. You've got to get your hands on the Ultra Smooth Package Shaving Care for down there for men. It's a three-part uh, process here for men in the shower. Get a good look at this. The razor, small. Not everything is all about size, but uh, you got the crop exfoliator and the crop gel, the exfoliator. you got to exfo exfoliate everything where we have... The, which is the biggest organ in the body, skin. Take care of it. Take care of what's going on down there where the sun never shines. The Ultra Smooth Package. Go to manscaped.com, put it in your cart, and other products. I pretty much We have pretty much all of them, but use this promo code right here. Mancave20, all one word, and that is your promo code. You get 20% off of your order, and that's compliments of that 20% right here stories inside the man cave um it, it has been a i hate to see it because i'm not gonna lie i love i've grown up a texas longhorn baseball fan and i, I love watching the college world series it was hard for a lot of fans today because a m just put it on texas and it was over with pretty quick um but yeah if you're in omaha excuse me uh omaha that was a wrong graphic right there Submit your picks from Omaha to at Stories Man Cave on Twitter. Still, look, I've received one. Um, love to see all of those amazing picks that uh, come out of Omaha. That, and if you don't have not been yet, make it a point to at least stay for a four day weekend. A lot of fun. It's just a unique experience, even for non sports fans. I'm going to pull up a picture. Um, watch the game today with this guy. Yeah, Nate Boyer. The storied long Texas Longhorn football deep snapper. Um, we we got together, um, went to Bolden Acres here in town, and as there's his friend, uh, we met. And I did not know that Nate Boyer was a big. He follows Texas baseball, and he uh, I tweeted this out and put it on Instagram too. And Nate said, uh, "Longhorns forever." 
Um, and he knew a lot about the game. He grew up playing baseball, and he was uh, we were talking about that. But Nate, yeah, he was uh, he took this one. It was, he, you could tell it was heartfelt, and that uh, he was severely disappointed, like so many other Longhorn fans have been as well. Um, happy Father's Day to each of you fathers, and I, I think I tweeted it out. I lost my father a week before I turned uh, about a little over a week before I turned 13 years old. And uh, post some pictures of my dad, David Clinch. Um, yeah, he, he did make an impact on my life. And his sh- my sh- you know, he died at age 43, liver cirrhosis. But there's usually not a week that goes by that I don't think of him and uh, still honor him on Father's Day for obvious reasons. But for those of you and all you dads who watch this, if you're uh, – influence on a young person or just have a a son or a daughter man big props to you salute you uh for playing perhaps one of the biggest roles in life that's being a good father and happy father's day i hope you did have a good father's day and also happy june team Yeah, happy Juneteenth. I got to remove Nate Dog's picture there. But uh, yeah, if you don't know the story behind Juneteenth, it was it's mainly a Texas holiday when uh, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in, uh, I think, 1863. It took two years for that notification to make its way to Texas. It actually made its way through the port of Galveston, and that's when enslaved African-Americans learned that they are free. It took two years. And that's what Juneteenth is all about, June 19th. So I would say continue celebrating that all week. The more you know, the better it is. And when you know your history and realize what that's about and the fact that it took two years for word of the Emancipation Proclamation to work its way all the way from D.C., Texas in the port of Galveston. Um, Wow. Happy Juneteenth. I salute the African-American community and this holiday as well. So we're putting a quick wrap up on episode 149, the College World Series Elimination Sundays behind us. Uh, Now Texas is coming home and OU sitting in the uh, driver's seat of that uh, bracket number one. And, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So now Texas A&M has got to find a way to beat Notre Dame, who OU uh, delivered their first loss to, and then beat Oklahoma twice to reach the national championship series against the winner, whoever that will be, a bracket two, which will take place on Monday. Yeah. So for the OG Man Cave boys, that being Harbaugh Hars, Big Mike, and Coach Mo, who helped me get this all started, we are out. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. Hop in my car and the giddy up.